Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, young people and their interested friends. As our brother Dennis uh, referred to in, in his opening prayer, it has been a year of significant change, um, significant uncertainty, to say the least. You know, we could talk of all the global events um, that have happened just in the last you know, eight or nine months, just, uh, you know, we have wildfires in Australia, now we have wildfires in uh, the west coast of, of the U.S., the global impacts of COVID on governments, on businesses, financial markets, drops in oil prices, the, the changes that we see happening in the nations of, of Russia, in, in Europe, and now even more recently, attempts at, at peace in the Middle East. All of these things heralding the, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I, what, what I would hazard to guess is that this year has also meant significant changes and uncertainty for, for each and every one of us at a personal level. Um, as individuals or as families, many things have, have changed. And obviously much of this has been brought uh, on us by the pandemic, but for others of us, it may be unrelated. It may be the health, maybe relationships or, or financial, whatever it may be, these changes, these uncertainties in our lives test us. And they test us intentionally. God uses circumstances in our lives to mold and shape us. I'd just like to take a quote from a, a local news article. And that article said, I believe COVID-19 has tested us in so many ways. We've been forced to reassess what is most important in our lives. And I think that's probably been said from many a uh, Christadelphian platform as well. But this was from a, a secular source, just a, a news article. And I heard the same sentiments from colleagues at work, especially at the beginning of this pandemic. And, and for a while, this mostly hit the adults. They were the ones that had to navigate the uncertainty and the change brought up brought along by, by COVID. But now with schools starting back up, whether it be in person or remotely, even our young people, even our some of our youngest Sunday school students are dealing with significant change in their lives. And much of this change is something that the ones who normally take care of them, their parents have no control over. Now, some of us cope with, with change better than others, but it does affect us all in, in some way. But why do people respond to change and uncertainty better than others? Well, partly it's the way we're wired. Some of us are more sensitive to that type of thing. We're all a bit different, but it's also dependent on how much is changing. I'm sure we can all accommodate a little bit of change. But for some in this world, this pandemic has turned their world totally upside down. Whether it be financial, health, everything that they came to rely upon was flipped over. But those such as ourselves that have a rock and a fortress in our Heavenly Father we have a constant to always rely upon. We have a huge advantage in always having something that does not change. But that assumes that we look to that rock, that we hold on to it. It assumes that we follow after the words of Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And I'm sure the Sunday school students know it because it was one of our memory verses last year, Proverbs 3, 
verses five and six, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Holding on to that constant depends on us trusting in him and leaning not on our own understanding, leaning not on ourselves. This is not two separate things. We don't trust in the Lord on one hand and then at other times lean not on our own understanding. These are things that go together. And I will admit to you that this is not something that is easy for me. It's, it's so natural to trust in self, in what we perceive as our own abilities. That's what the world teaches us to do, to better yourself, to take care of things on your own. And whether we know it or not, we, we all trust in something every day. What do you put your trust in? Maybe it's trusting in your ability or your health. Maybe it's trusting in your financial resources or, or status, or maybe some relationships. Unfortunately, trusting in God doesn't just happen once we repent or once we are baptized. It's a choice that we have to make daily. But thankfully, trusting in God, it's not about us. It's not about what we can do, but about him and what he can do. It's about refusing to hold on and bravely or faithfully choosing to, to let go. So what does it really mean to, to trust? For said we need to trust in God. What, what does that really mean? Well, trust simply, in, in, in a general term, is a firm or assured belief. So, for instance, if I was to walk across my living room floor, I have the firm belief that it will hold my weight, that as I walk across, I don't have any concern that I'm going to end up in my basement. I believe it so strongly that I don't think about that when I walk through my living room. Trust is resting on a fact as true and acting on it. Now to trust in someone is to place your confidence or assurance in him or her. So as an example of that, when our kids were young, and maybe when I was a little bit stronger, I would toss them up in the air. They would laugh, they would giggle, and they would have a great time because they had no concern that I would let them fall. Again, to trust someone is to rely on that person to be faithful. Now, full disclosure, Lois is looking across the room at me right now, and uh, she was not as trusting and frowned upon this activity a little bit. She perceived that there was potential danger, but for the kids, it didn't cross their mind. They trusted that their dad would catch them, that no harm would come to them. Now, it's evident that we are to trust God, as we read in Proverbs chapter 3. In many other scriptures, we, we can do a search for trust, and it comes out throughout scripture. We need to be confident that God will do us good. We should rely on the fact that he will remain faithful to us. And as we are told, will direct our path. We should realize that God will never let us fall. Our first reading this morning was in 2 Kings chapter 19. And we have the events recorded for us of Hezekiah, the, the king of Judah and ultimately the defeat of the Assyrian army. And I know many of you know these events and 
know them well that were read for us about Hezekiah and this Assyrian army. But this morning, we would like to take a brief look at what we can learn from this king. That we are told in, we're, we're introduced to, to him in the previous chapter. And at the beginning of chapter 18 of Second Kings, if you'll turn there, we see a summary. A summary of King Hezekiah. And in verse 3, we're told, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. So here we have before us one of the good kings of Judah. And although that would be an amazing thing for the divine record to say about any one of us, to say that we did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, that's not specifically why we're going to look at Hezekiah this morning. It's God's summary, his divine assessment of him in verses 5 and 6 that stands out to me. In verse, verse 5, we read, He trusted in the Lord, God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave. That word is the same as what you we read of in, in Genesis chapter 2 about a, a man cleaving unto his wife, like a marriage. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. What a testimony concerning King Hezekiah. He was incomparable among the kings of Judah. In terms of trusting the Lord. His trust in God was his distinguishing mark. As believers, Hezekiah stands as a portrait of trust for us. If we want to understand trust, Hezekiah is who we are to look to. So we're going to take a look at the Bible account of King Hezekiah. And even though he wasn't perfect in this regard, he is an example that is left on scripture for us. So it wasn't that Hezekiah was especially strong, like say Samson, or, or intellectual and knowledgeable like Solomon that made him stand out. Hezekiah was probably a lot like us. He had troubles. He had challenges, insecurities. He had times of crisis. He had responsibilities. He had a very demanding job. But what made him stand out was his trust in the Lord. Now, if it was his intellect, most of us could legitimately say, well, we can't compete with that. He must have been really smart. Or if it was his strength, most of us would fall short of what the God's ideal of of strength is. But because God noticed Hezekiah because of his trust in the Lord, we can take confidence in the fact that we all have the ability to trust in the Lord, just like Hezekiah did. So we're going to try to learn from, from him. So at the beginning of, of 2 Kings 18, we see that in, in verse 2 that Hezekiah is 25 years old when he begins to reign. So Relatively young when he when he begins to reign, and he refused to rely rely upon foreign nations for help against the invading enemies, especially the huge enemy that of of the Assyrians. We read in chapter eighteen, verse seven, and the Lord was with Hezekiah wherever he went; he prospered. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Keep in mind, the Assyrians were the dominant nation at this time. This was a risky thing for Hezekiah to do. For him to choose to rebel against the Assyrians. 
they had destroyed and subdued so many surrounding nations, which we later read of in chapter 19. Early on in Hezekiah's reign, they actually took the, the 10 northern tribes of Israel. And by the time we get to verse 13, we're told that in the 14th year of the reign of Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, enters Judah with a massive army. And he began to seize the cities of Judah. And at this point, Hezekiah is being tried. There is a huge trial before him. As king of Judah, cities that he is responsible for are being overrun by the Assyrians. And at this point, he tries to deal with it on his own, without reaching out to God. Under great trial as a leader, Hezekiah pleads with Sennacherib to withdraw from his land. Just take a look at verse 14. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me that which thou puttest on me I will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed to Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Hezekiah agreed to pay this, this ransom fee. Now, we don't use talents as a weight of measure right now, but this was no small amount. A talent is like in somewhere around 100 pounds. So we're talking thousands of pounds of gold and tens of thousands of pounds of silver. So about 3,000 pounds of gold and 30,000 pounds of silver. All of which, when he found out how much this was being asked of, of him from Assyria, he had to go to the temple. He had to take stuff that had been dedicated to the temple, even to the point of stripping gold off the doors and pillars of the temple to pay it out to the Assyrians. If it was that much gold and silver right now, it would be worth over a hundred million dollars. And what do the Assyrians do? They say, thank you for the gold and silver. You have just uh, financed our next military campaign. And we are now coming back to Jerusalem. He sends a great army to Jerusalem. And under the direction of Rabshakeh and others, demands an unconditional surrender. But Hezekiah doesn't concede to the Assyrians. And why not? Well, firstly, I think he learned from, from giving all the gold and silver from the temple that he cannot do it on his own. So he trusted in God. And it should be noted that it appears that Hezekiah was renowned for his trust in God at this time. So even his enemies acknowledged his trust. If you just take a look, Rabshakeh warns when he's talking to the people on the wall later on in chapter 18. Chapter 18 and verse 30. He says, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. So he's, the, Rabshakeh is telling the people, don't let Hezekiah convince you to trust in the Lord. And then later on in, ver, in chapter 19. When he sends his messengers, he says in verse 10 of chapter 19, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. So it appears that Hezekiah is known for trusting in the Lord. And we obviously read that divine summary in chapter 5 of, or in verse 5 of chapter 18. 
But remember that Hezekiah is faced with what appeared to be an insurmountable problem. There was a massive military army, a machine arrayed against him and his people. And what is the, uh, the threatening message that is given to him? Well, we read it in our reading in, in 2 Kings chapter 19. If you just come in at verse 11 of 2 Kings 19, we read, Behold, hast thou heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly? And shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Respa, and the children of Eden, which were in Thelazar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arphad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, of Hena and of Iva? How could Hezekiah even dare to defy or resist this power? He knows that God let the ten tribes of the north be taken by these same Assyrians. He could have justified in his mind that this is what God wants. Was he crazy? Well, no. Hezekiah trusted in the, in the Lord even in the face of what appeared to be an insurmountable problem. But when we say he trusted in the Lord, what did he actually do? What, what, does, what does it mean that he trusted in the Lord? Well, he took some critical steps that I think we can all learn from. So take a look at our reading here in 2 Kings 19. First thing he does is he humbles himself and goes to God. 2 Kings 19 verse 1. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. So he humbles himself and goes into the house of the Lord. And then he seeks help from God through Isaiah. In verses two to seven, we see that he sends his servants, his key individuals of, of his house, he sends to Isaiah. Verse 2, and he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amon. And they go to Hezekiah, and they speak to him, and Hezekiah responds in, in, in verse 6, and Isaiah says to them, Thus shall ye say to your master, thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, he shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So he received a response from Isaiah that he's going to be sent away. And that he's going to fall by the sword in his own land. But from Hezekiah's point of view, has the trial ended? Is it over? Well, no. We see that the very next thing that happens is it almost seems as though it's gotten worse. Sure, Rabshakeh has left, but he sent messengers with a letter. He sent messengers with a what I'll call a last chance letter. It's your last chance to, to surrender. Don't expect that your God's going to be able to save you. And we see that in verses 9 through 13. And we read a bunch of that already. And then Hezekiah takes another important step. He spreads the letter. He lays out his concern before God in verse 14. Verse 14, and Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. So not only does he 
lay out his concern. But then he goes on into prayer. And his prayer goes from verse 15 to 19. And the thing that I found very powerful about Hezekiah's prayer is he didn't lay out, this is the problem that we have with the Assyrians wanting to, to conquer us. His prayer is not about self. It's not about self-preservation. In humility, it was about God and his glory. Let's just read this, this prayer, starting at verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubim, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the, the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. It was about God and his glory, about that all the earth may know that he is in control. And it's in these same steps we need to emulate in putting our trust in God. Now, we don't have Isaiah, the prophet, to go to. But we do have the words of Isaiah the prophet and all the other inspired writings that we can go to. So our key steps would be very similar. We likewise have to humble ourselves. Or as we read in, in Proverbs, lean not on our own understanding. We need to, to seek out through his word. And we need to lay our concerns before him in prayer to his glory, not our own. So we've seen this, this pattern of scripture of, of humbling ourselves and calling unto God in prayer as key in trusting in him. Now, in our mind, we are Maybe I'll say, I may be able to academically believe that. And for me to say it before you, or at a little green light on the top of my computer, it's easy for me to do. But to actually live it with an unwavering trust toward God, well, that's a different matter, isn't it? And we need to realize that does trusting in him solve all of our, our trials? Because trusting in God does not mean that everything will go the way you want it to. If that were true, those who follow God should be the most enviable people on the whole planet. Everything would go their way. But, but obviously that's not it. It's not about it going our way. Believers throughout the ages and in some parts of the world even today are really put to death for their belief. Others lose their jobs, their livelihood. Some people think that believing in God does entitle them to a problem-free life. If they have problems, they think either they, they don't have enough faith or trust in God, or God's not holding up his end of the bargain. Or likewise, if someone's life is going really well, that, well, they must have faith, and God's taking care of them. But the Bible contradicts that idea. The Lord Jesus Christ says it in John chapter 16, in this world, you will have trouble. And a lot of the most godly characters in the Bible suffered tremendously. God did perform many miracles that we see in scripture. But he did not miraculously protect all of his people from everything. 
Think of Joseph. He was wrongly accused of rape and was put in a prison for years, languishing there for what appeared to be nothing. Now we know by the divine record that it was, he went through those things for the saving of his, his house. Ruth lost her husband and became a poor peasant in a foreign land far from home. But we know that ultimately she became part of the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. All but one of Jesus' disciples were tortured and murdered for proclaiming the truth about him. And the one that did survive was banished to an isolated island in his old age. And in Hezekiah's day, the people of Judah still had the Assyrians sweep through their land, conquered many cities, and killed many people. In the end, the suffering and pain is something everyone must face, whether you trust in God or not. And trusting in God does not mean that God will explain everything that's going on in our lives. God didn't answer Job when he asked, why me? And really, God doesn't owe us an explanation when life is painful and confusing. When bad things happen, many of us are tempted to ask why. Some of us get an answer, but many of us never do. I don't see that Hezekiah was really told why the Assyrians came and took so many of the cities. I won't tell you to, to stop asking because maybe your specific situation is one of those that will get an answer this side of the kingdom. But as we see through scripture that sometimes the why isn't told to us. Only through the inspired word sometimes are we told the why of certain events. But I'm saying that if you don't get an, an explanation, don't be surprised. Because the reality is, his ways are so much higher than our ways. But trusting God does mean that no matter what happens, we will turn to him instead of away from him. Instead of turning to ourselves, to our own strengths, to the strengths of other men. We will humble, humble ourselves and realize that without him, we can do nothing. Just as we read in Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy path. Doesn't mean it will work out to what we think is good right now, but it does mean that he will direct our paths for our ultimate good. This morning we've considered Hezekiah who reached out to bring his problem to God. He learned from when he failed to trust in God and, and gave a hundred million dollars to the Assyrian. He didn't just stop and pray where he was when he received the letter. He went up to the house of the Lord. He took the letter with him and presented it before God. He made a special effort to come before God. And God is there for those who arrange their hearts in humility and make the effort to present themselves a living sacrifice before him. Our house of the Lord is embodied in the Lord Jesus Christ as the true tabernacle. This is where we must meet with God, our mediator. So we come this morning to consider the perfect example. The perfect example of the Lord Jesus Christ that trusted his father, trusted him even to death on the cross. So I'm going to close with Short reading from 
letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Starting at verse 14, where we read, Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it all for it is all for your sake. So that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are, are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. 